If there's one question I'm asked inevitably year after year, it's about my desktop background. Uh, for some years now, it's been set to a rather attractive photograph of the Vatican Laocoon, one of the finest examples of Hellenistic Baroque. Laocoon, flanked by his two sons, fights against a pair of sea serpents, as recounted in the second book of Virgil's Aeneid. The stress of the moment is captured in the tension of his straining muscles, which are on full display, because all three human figures are completely nude. This tends to cause a certain degree of consternation in my classes, especially in the lower years. Pupils, especially the boys, for some reason, seem to think there's something slightly inappropriate about them being unclothed. And so the question is, Miss, why are they all naked? To answer that, you have to know something about the context in which these statues were produced. Uh, I'm going to talk about the archaic and classical periods in Greece, and especially Athens, uh, the city from which we have the most evidence. Bear with me because it is a bit circuitous at the beginning, but all will be explained. Ancient Greece was heavily patriarchal, especially so at Athens. That is to say, men were in charge. Athenian women couldn't own property, uh, nor could they conduct any transaction worth more than a bushel of barley, legally speaking. Uh, in fact, legally, every woman had to have a kyrios, a male guardian. Uh, the ideal was for well-off ladies to be inside the home, dealing with matters there, while the men worked outside. A respectable woman, by the way, couldn't even be named in a court of law. She's only referred to as so-and-so's daughter or so-and-so's wife. Whether this is precisely how it worked in practice is up for some debate, but the ideal is very much that there were separate spheres for men and women. The result of this was a society in which women were excluded from public life. And among the elite, it produced homosocial environments. Women stayed at home in the women's quarters of the house, supervising the slaves, weaving wool, while male aristocrats met up with their male friends. In the evening, this would take the form of drinking parties, called symposia, that took place at home, either your home or somebody else's, in the Andreon, the men's quarters. Women were, uh, were invited to these, but not all women, only courtesans and dancing girls. A respectable woman would never have attended one, even in her own home. In the daytime, well-born men would often spend time at the gymnasium. This is a gym in the sense that we use the term, but also much more. It had a palaestra, which is um, often translated as a wrestling school. It's an arena for wrestling, running, boxing, weightlifting, and so on. Uh, but there was also a mess hall where food was served and philosophers and sophists would hang about shady colonnades to teach the young men who came there. It was a place to exercise the mind as well as the body. And as you might imagine, it was a prime spot to socialise. The men did most of this in the nude. All exercise at the time was taken naked. The gymnasium was a place where you were gumnos, which is Greek for unarmed or naked. You'd get dressed to go and eat at least in your cloak, but these men were spending a good deal of their time around other men without a stitch on. The Greeks did have a nudity taboo, lest anyone think they were wandering down, down the street like this, but it wasn't present in all male environments like the gymnasium, in the same way that, for instance, in Scandinavia today, it's perfectly normal to be nude with your same-sex friends in a sauna. This bred a kind of cult of the body, which finds its expression in kuros, technical term here, kuroi, one kouros, several kouroi, are archaic Greek statues of idealised young men. Uh, they're always nude. They vary in size, though most are around two metres tall, and they have the same rather stiff pose. Uh, hands clenched at the thighs, one foot slightly advanced, looking straight ahead, often with a smile carved on their faces. We have plenty of these kouroi. Got loads of them. Their primary purposes were votive and funerary. That is to say, they were dedicated as offerings to the gods, and they were grave stones. Don't know about you, but I would be a bit surprised if somebody now decided that they would best be immortalised on their gravestone as a hunky, over-life-size naked youth. But the Kuroi reflect how elite Athenians wanted to be viewed, and how they wanted to be remembered. Kuroi are expensive for a start. Uh, statue that big, need lots of money. And the body they depict couldn't have been obtained through manual labour. Uh, Kouros is musculature gym sculpted. 
and it shows that its subject was wealthy enough to have lots of leisure time to spend with his friends in the palaestra, rather than doing anything so plebeian as holding down a job. The hair of Kuro is also elaborate. It's often formed into a kind of beaded style, as we call it, um, and with these carefully sculpted snail curls around the hairline. Uh, that's the hairstyle of a man who doesn't do his own hairstyling, but has a slave hairdresser and plenty of time. There's little suggestion that these statues were meant to accurately represent the physical appearance of the deceased. Frankly, they don't look different enough from each other for that. They were simply idealised versions of the young warrior, what every man, every elite man, aspired to be. And they were naked, so that the musculature and the powerful, heroic body was on full display. To be handsome and fit was about more than just looking good. The Greek phrase kalos kagathos means fine and good, and it reflects the Greek belief that outer beauty reflected inner virtue. At the ancient Olympics, there was even what we would now call a beauty contest for men, since women weren't permitted to compete in the games. Masculine beauty was something to admire. But of course, it's not true that all Greek statues were nude. Um, these archaic kuroi were, but their female counterparts called korai, one kore, several korai, were inevitably clothed. We have a multitude of korai left as votive offerings to the gods, and they reflect the changing fashions in Athens. Sometimes they wear a thick woolen peplos, sometimes a filmy chiton, um, always modestly covered up with a himati on the cloak. They are ide as idealized as the kuroi. Uh, they're young, beautiful, wealthy. Many of them were sculpted in marble, but had jewellery added in bronze. So uh, necklaces, earrings, brooches, the lot. So how do we get all these nude female classical sculptures that we see about the place in museums and so on? There were nude and semi-nude female statues around. The dying Amazon, for example, several of her type, and the dying Nyabid, uh, a maidservant in the gable end of a pediment on the temple of Zeus at Olympia, whose dress has come undone to expose one breast. Slave women and low-class prostitutes are often painted naked on pots, on the ground that they have no modesty to be outraged. But respectable women were always clothed. The explanation for the semi-dressed female statues uh, is that all these women are depicted as suffering violence. Uh, this made it acceptable for them to be portrayed with bare breasts or indeed the case of the dying Nybid, there's an arrow in her back. Um, she's fallen to one knee and mysteriously this has made all her clothes fall off. Um, eventually also the so-called wet look drapery comes into fashion. Uh, it's exemplified on the Parthenon. Viewer can make out a great deal of the bodies of the three lounging goddesses through their filmy dresses, but because they're still technically clothed, um, this was also acceptable. Um, it's rather like uh, the cliche wet sari scene in a Bollywood film. Bollywood films, of course, are strictly censored for nudity, sexual themes, but they do permit wet, clinging clothing, um, in seen for the nubile female lead as a kind of proxy for, for actual nudity. Same thing here. This changes in the classical period. A sculptor named Praxiteles was commissioned by the people of Cos, which is a Greek island, Nigian, to make a cult statue of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, beauty and sex. He chose to depict her naked. The statue is sometimes known as the Venus Prudence, modest Venus, because she appears to have been surprised at her bath and she modestly covers her vulva with one hand and she reaches for a towel with the other. Um, she's not suffering violence, so there's no respectable reason for her to be nude, except that Prexit Lee thought it was appropriate and presumably wanted to sculpt a naked lady. The story, of course, has become perhaps slightly mythologised in the repeated telling, but it's clear that the statue caused some uproar. The Cossians, who had commissioned the statue, announced they couldn't possibly take it now. Uh, so the people of Knidos, another island, said, oh, we'll have it. And so they put it in their temple of Aphrodite, where it became an ancient tourist attraction. Uh, the, there's an ancient joke that runs that Aphrodite herself came down from Olympus to come view the statue of her, and asked, but when did Praxiteles see me naked? Implying that it's the perfect rendition of the goddess's figure. 
after this, neutrino statues became increasingly common and were no longer shocking. It's interesting that the nudity of Greek male statues seems to baffle so many people who ask me the question about why they're all naked. But female nudity is taken for granted. Nobody is surprised by statues of naked from the kingdoms, for example. Uh, men are the assumed viewers of these statues, as they were in antiquity, and we take it for granted that men like looking at pictures of naked women. They also, as we see from the statues, like looking at pictures of naked men. Youthful male beauty was taken seriously as an object of admiration, and we find plenty of Greek poetry extolling the beauty of the youths of the poet's acquaintance. This my younger pupils often find hardest to swallow, because it relies on recognising that ancient Greek took a certain degree of male bisexuality as the norm. R.R. Smith, an expert on Greek art, once wrote in an article the assertion, Kuroi are sexy. Now, obviously, the rather stiff looking Kuroi aren't to everybody's taste. But if you look at, say, the Anavistos Kouros, which was a grave marker for a man named Kroisos, and his powerful thighs, his athletic body, his idealised smiling face, I think you can recognise that, yeah, he's meant, to, he's meant to depict a real hunk. When discussing naked male statues, we often use the phrase heroic nudity, which describes statues of Zeus hurling a thunderbolt or Perseus holding Medusa's head while dressed in only his wing boots and a sword belt. But that's where the convention originates. Perseus is a hero, and you can tell he's a hero because he's beautiful and fit and also nude. The standardised lack of clothing for male statues continues in part because of the classical interest in depicting them in human form. Methods of casting large bronze statues were discovered, and since bronze has a higher tensile strength than marble, that is to say you can have an arm sticking out without it falling off, uh, more ambitious poses were quickly adopted. The aim was to convey realistic turning and tensing of the body, for which the whole body had to be visible for it to be effective. The Doriforos, the spear bearer, is a good example, sculpted by a chap called Polyclitus, because instead of standing four square, specifically forward, like Kuroi, um, his pose is more natural. Uh, he has his weight on one leg, which pushes up his other hip. Uh, this subtle change can only be observed if the body is nude, which provides the sculptor an opportunity to show off his skill. Uh, the Discobolos, the discus thrower by Myron, is another famous example. The athlete is caught at the moment before he releases the discus. This is realistic, since he would have competed naked, but it's also a wonderful piece of art because of how the sculptor has captured the tension in his muscles and given the impression of movement barely restrained. So that's a short answer to why are all Greek statues naked. It lies in the construction of ancient Greek societies and how they wanted to depict themselves, and what they considered attractive and worth dedicating to the gods. It also lies in aristocratic taste and how the elites of Athens signified their wealth and leisure. And most of all, it lies in the ideal of beauty. Statues were nude to demonstrate power, the skill of the sculptor, heroic status, but above all because the Greeks believed that the human body in itself was beautiful.